Welcome to the UTPA Men's Basketball Show. My name is Jonah Goldberg, and we're joined by Dan Hipsher, the head coach of the UTPA Men's Basketball Team. Uh, the Bronx are, again, and I feel like this is a, a theme sometimes, or at least it has been the first half of the season, back home again, finally, and uh, looking forward to playing back-to-back uh, -back home games for the first time in two months, uh, in, well, starting tomorrow, actually. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we've been kind of road warriors, but it's, uh, you know, a time of the year where now at least, you know, every week you're going to, or every other week, you're going to have a couple home games and, and uh, you know, it's a little more consistent time of the year for us. So a little more preparation time and uh, hopefully can get this thing turned around a little bit. Well, you finally got to open up conference play. You did it at Grand Canyon. Uh, university in uh, what can only be described as an old western shootout 91-85 final score. Yeah we uh, had a, a great offensive night for us really you know shooting nearly 50 percent from the field and uh, 15 assists and five turnovers but uh, their ability to uh, shoot and make threes uh, was a huge factor in the game and and also uh, their ability to get to the free throw line. You know, they made 14 out of 28 threes and 27 out of 31 free throws. It's funny, they were playing man-to-man -man defense, we were playing zone, but they doubled us at the free throw line. So it's hmm. uh, it was a fairly unique night to say the least. Well, and also, I mean, those numbers you just threw out there, generally when a team hits 14 threes and goes 27-31 for the line, if you just told me those numbers, my initial reaction would be blowout, but it wasn't. It was a close game pretty much throughout. A six-point game was the final. It was within a possession with less than a minute to go. Uh, how did you keep it so close? Well, we didn't turn the ball over. As I said, you know, five uh, turnovers, they had 17, so there was a differential there. Uh, we outscored, you know, 34 baskets to 25, uh, you know, uh, kept ourselves in it. Like you say, with, uh, I don't know, 55 seconds left, it's a one-point game. They have possession. Uh, they crank through the clock. Uh, I kind of looked down. They were a little confused about what defense we were in, what was going on. Guy went in, penetrated, kicked it out. They stumbled, threw a three in, and uh, made it a four-point game. But... You know, we had had our opportunity, and uh, I think we discussed this the other day, that, you know, if you can get in the last couple minutes on the road and have a chance to win, that's what you're looking for. You just have to find a way to win. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, the 34 field goals, amazing. Uh, you shot 64% in the in the second half, and th those are the kind of halves that you just you dream about. Well, we were just driving the ball like crazy. We knew we had the ability to move the ball through the motion and then drive it, and... Uh, they, they struggled to defend it, but it didn't matter. They just went down, and, and uh, it was kind of the old uh, Paul Westhead, uh, we'll, we'll score three, we'll give you two. <laughs> mm. And uh, the turnovers you mentioned, too, the five turnovers, the fewest by a Bronx team since uh, 2008, so uh, fewest in, uh, you're looking at almost six years uh, or five years. I mean, that's... Uh, that's, that's really impressive to be able to do that. Well, it was good. And uh, because a lot of times, you know, you shoot yourself in the foot. It's not always they're stealing the ball or pressuring you. A lot of times it's just a guy with poor footwork walking or, you know, making silly plays. And our guys took care of the ball that night and it gave themselves an opportunity to win. And, you know, uh, not throwing the ball away kept them out of transition and, and, and some things that they do. But you know, give them credit too. They've got some quality kids. They've got a couple of high major division one transfers that can play and, uh, and, and they played well. And uh, four players in double figures for your team. And you can you know, two who reached 25 points for career highs. You start with uh, Shaq Boga, who he hadn't played in the previous game and he comes out and he was just bunkers. Yeah, he played really well. Uh, uh, didn't shoot well. He, he's been our best three point shooter. and. He had some good looks, and again, to try to nullify what they were doing from the three line, it would have been good for him to do, but, but Shaq saw a great opportunity to drive, read the defense well, did a great job getting to the rim, and what he finished the game with 25, and then uh, what, six assists, one turnover, so yeah. did a great job getting to the rim. Uh, I thought you know, could have been to the free throw line a few more times. He took some bumps in there, but uh, did a great job finishing. And maybe a partially a product of all the three-pointers Grand Canyon was hoisting up, but uh, career-high eight rebounds. 
Yeah, that was part of those balls bouncing all over the place. And uh, I forgot about that. He had a great night scrambling for rebounds, and, and that was a big part of it. And we talked about it before the game that it was going to be a big, big night for guards to rebound because of the way the ball would be bouncing. And Javon Farrell, uh, you know, he's had several 20-point games for you, but 25, that ties his career high set at UMass a couple years ago. And it's always fun when you see a guy in his fifth year still setting career highs. Well, exactly. You know, he came off the bench and came in and gave us a great push and, and, and uh, shot the ball uh, well off the, uh, you know, driving. He hit a couple threes and, and uh, you know, was the one kid that did get to the free throw line a little bit and then threw three steals into that mess too. So... He really kind of filled up the stat line that night and did a great job uh, also, again, uh, driving, getting to the rim. Points in the paint, I mean, obviously driving getting to the rim. I mean, I love that differential, 48 to 18 in favor <laughs> of your team. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, uh, a relatively hot night for the three kind of took care of that. But, uh, you know, uh, again, it, it was their night, you know. Uh, you could put guys in the gym and take 28 threes they took and not necessarily make 14 of them. So uh, uh, they had one hit the front of the rim, hit the top of the backboard and fall in. They had another bank in. So, you know, some things happened that way, but, but uh, we also gave them some opportunities. Well, Grand Canyon was playing their first Division I conference game, and they, uh, in front of a huge crowd, hopefully when we play our first WAC home game on Thursday, we'll do so in front of a similarly huge crowd to, to feed off of that kind of energy that they seem to have. Well, they had a great environment, believe me. Uh, had a big alumni gathering before the game out front, had the place packed out. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it reminded me when I was at the Division Three level of a Christian school we used to play called Cedarville over in Ohio. And, and uh, uh, Grand Canyon has that same kind of a, 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 a or support base behind it, and the place was just slammed and really fun environment, neat place to play in. You go from one uh, good environment to another. Is that you you get on a plane, get yourself over to Houston, and then to College Station to take on uh, Texas A&M on uh, Saturday. And I thought Billy Kennedy had a very uh, telling quote after the game. The coach of the Aggies, he said that uh, nobody's been able to put these guys away all year. I don't care what their record is or something to that effect. And, I mean, you know, you can look at the final score, 63-46, but I look at it was a one-possession game with 10 minutes to go, and A&M, you know, they went on a run to close out the game. But this is like every game you've played against these tough com competition, you're there, you play with them. And, you know, while the final result may, be, may not be what you like, it tells me that – it's going to happen, and you, that makes you a very dangerous team to play. Well, right now we're in the mode where you're wondering if it's going to happen <laughs> or we're going to be that every night, you know, because we have these five- to seven-minute spurts in games, Jonah, that I think in the A&M game we're right there. It's basket back and forth, uh, five points, three points, you know, right in there. And then we go eight, nine minutes without a field goal. And uh, – I'll be honest with you, it, it, it's normally you kind of look out and go, well, hey, I'm, I'm going to run something for Jonah and get him that, that ball and that shot. But we, we're struggling for that guy, you know. And unfortunately, the guys we go to, Boga and Javon mostly, uh, and Shaq, uh, Hines, you know, they're still kind of perimeter-based guys. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it was tougher against A&M in the fact that I could draw up some plays that open up some driving or use the motion to try to get some driving. A little harder drive against two six five guards, two six eight forwards, and a six nine center for us to get to the basket and find an easy basket. So uh, we got caught with a couple jump shots, and they made some good plays and stretched the game out. But as you know, it was it was in no way a 15, 16 point game. Oh, I mean. First half, you had the lead. Dustin Leathers hit three early three-pointers uh, as part of his uh, career best four three-pointer night, and uh, you were up 21-20. And you know they went on a little run. You got closer, um, and then it was interesting the first half and the second half. Whereas the first half, I thought was more when I mean, you had a bunch of those more long-range shots, uh, didn't shoot a free throw for 25 minutes. But then all of a sudden, the free throws started to come. And while the final total wasn't a lot, it was eight attempts. It, it it looked like you were, there was a little more aggression. There were more offensive rebounds. Nine of the ten came in the second half. 
and there was more getting to the rim, which, uh, you know, it's a great adjustment. Well, it's an adjustment we tried to make. We felt we were in the game without doing it, and, and we needed to get at the basket more, try to get on the board more, and, and, and present problems for them that way. And we did get to the free throw line a little bit more. But uh, again, their size, strength, physicality were pretty hard to play against. Like, you know, Caruso's playing a point at 6'5", and, yeah. and, and Green 6'5". They, they just got great size and strength. But one thing I was happy with, they're a, they're a very sound defensive team. And we were able to to, I think, get shots and present problems for them that, that made them struggle defensively at times. Unfortunately, we weren't be able to, to lock them up, you know, like some other teams have. But e even then, they shot, what, low 40s in yeah, the game? Yeah, 41%. And our problem was, again, 33% uh, from the field uh, makes it hard to go out on the road and get a, get a victory. So, you know, we're trying to shore it up this week, find ways, you know, to, to – to, develop some maybe some offense from defense and try to get to the rim a little more and, and try to get it cleaned up but great great experience for our kids a and is a great environment as you saw beautiful arena and uh, uh first time i'd been to college station i was thoroughly impressed you know you speak uh, speaking of the arena it's just it is a great place to play basketball uh there was one thing i noticed in the second half uh, that i want to ask you about see if that may, had any effect at all um the, you guys were shooting west, and every now and then the west side doors uh, at the top of the concourse would open up, fans going in and out. And me on presser, I got blinded if I was facing that direction. All of a sudden the sun just came right in my face, or if I was facing the other way, I noticed it made the TV guys uh, look angelic. So I was wondering, did you guys see that at all? No, we didn't. I didn't notice that, but okay. uh, thank God we, we shoot far out sometimes, but not quite press rows. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, I think we're all right. But it might have popped on the floor some. I just, I just didn't notice it. I, you know, you get going with the flow of the game. But that's interesting to see. And, and uh, but I didn't give the kids a, a chance to give me an excuse why they were shooting poorly. But maybe they would have come up with that one if they didn't know. <laughs> well, well, that's mine. They, they can't take that one. Okay. <laughs> if I miss the play during the broadcast, then that's what I've got. There you go. <laughs> uh, you know. You know, we talked a little before the game about uh, turnovers, and you know, we talked earlier in the show, too. Uh, 12 turnovers, which still isn't bad, especially against a team like A&M. A&M at 13, and while not a big differential, it does make you just the fifth team this year to commit fewer turnovers than the Aggies in a game. Well, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, again, I, like I said, they are a very good defensive team, yeah. and uh, we're doing a better job of taking care of the ball, uh, which allows us then to have opportunities to score. And now, as I told the kids, you know, missing a shot's not the worst thing in the world. You have every opportunity to get an offensive rebound, and you can go back and set your defense. And what you try to tell the kids, Joan, is don't let that offensive end dictate the energy you're putting into your defensive end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all play the game to score baskets. We all, basketball's about putting the ball in the basket. But... And it can become depressing when you're not making shots and that's not going well for you. But you've still got to go back and play the defensive end more like a football player concept that mm. this is my job. I'm, I'm a defensive player, you know. So uh, you got to play both ends, but don't let one end affect the other. It's a good philosophy. Um... And not saying it works. No, oh, right. I'm, I'm not. No, I'm not saying we're grasping it. It works. I'm yeah. not saying we're grasping it yet. But and, and it is a hard thing, you know, to not have that affect you all the time. And, and the reason, the other, the other part of that is, it does affect you in the fact that you're in transition defense much more. You know, you're right. not, you're not going back setting your defense every time. And. Uh, so, you know, the offensive end does affect it a little bit. It just, I don't want it to affect them mentally in their effort. Right, instead of, uh, you know, like, darn, I missed the shot and thinking about that for the next defensive possession. Right. Just worry about making sure they miss their shot. Exactly, exactly. Uh, one guy I was very impressed with uh, off the bench, uh, you know, we, I mentioned the free throws earlier, it was actually Hurley Johnson. I, you know, he went 0 for 2 from the field, but that, that didn't really concern me. He, he shot your first four free throws, he hit them all. And I just loved he put his head down and he went for it. Exactly. He got himself into a couple gaps. 
Uh, he created those uh, four points off free throws, and uh, you may remember at the end of the first half, he got in the middle of the lane and kicked out into Majewski, and Majewski hit a three. Yep. So, you know, that's uh, – he did a good job. Uh, uh, he struggled at times, but uh, he, he, Hurley Johnson never comes to practice or a game with the wrong value system in mind. He wants to help the team. He, he's a great person and a, a kid that I will help for the rest of, of his life. Um, he is a great kid. So uh, we all root for him to do well, and, and hopefully that's a, a good sign for him. You know. A, he went through some pretty tough times in the Houston game and a few others that uh, 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 hopefully he's going to bounce back from. Yeah, didn't even get to play against Grand Canyon, but first guy off the bench at A&M, which uh, you know, I think speaks a lot to uh, what he can bring. Well, one of the comments that I made, Jonah, after the game to some of the kids that, that uh, haven't been playing or playing very well is uh, I kind of looked up and I said, Hurley, did you play the last game? And he goes, no, sir. And I said, well, guys, that should tell you something. You know, he was ready to play. He came in, he played well, and he got more minutes because of that. You know, it's not about me giving you minutes. It's about when opportunity presents itself, you take advantage of those minutes and play well. That, that tends to help you get to play more. Yeah, you know, something like what Shaq Hines has been doing all year where he just, every time you look up, he's in double figures. He's getting about seven rebounds, and uh, he's just, he, he's really uh, had a good sophomore season. Well, no doubt about it. He's uh, been a consistent guy, and one of the things I'd been on him about was when we played these higher-level teams, you know, for him to produce a little more. And uh, he struggled at Bradley but played better at TCU, struggled against SMU, but then had a very, very nice game the other day. Uh, the other day. He blew a couple layups or it would have been a, a special day because the 5 for 13 was really not indicative of the game he played. He, right. he played a little better than that, but he got to the rim and, and uh, drove the ball and, and, again, rebounded the basketball. And He's, again, a great kid to coach and, and uh, ha has his mind about the right things. Justin Leathers, a guy who's been uh, turning it on lately, uh, 12 points at Grand Canyon, 13 Texas A&M. Uh, he also had three steals at A&M, the four three-pointers, seven rebounds. And uh, you know, here's a guy who was one of the one of the top guys on the team last year. This year, he got off to a hot start, then he kind of just he went through a little funk. But I think it's three of the last four games he's been in double figures. You think he's starting to come around? I hope so. Uh, again, uh, another great work ethic kid, good person. Uh, comes with the right values all the time and you know last year he was a fifth six wheel guy you know just kind of get what came to him play a few minutes here there you know start but you know wasn't the guy that had now he's got a little more on his plate and I think he's really it's been tough for him but he's found a way now to get back in a rhythm and, and, and be productive he started off the season pretty well went through a hard time and now has bounced back with a couple good games. So we're looking for a, a good finish to the year from him, and we need it. Well, your next game, uh, your whack home opener, you face off uh, against Idaho. Uh, what kind of team is Idaho? Idaho's got a really good power forward, a uh, highly skilled kid that can really drive it. They're scrappy. They, 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 uh, we're, we're in a funny situation. Seattle was picked, I think, second in the league. Okay, Idaho was picked in the middle of the league. Both of them opened up at home and struggled. And they're coming in here with, <laughs> I'm sure, their ears burning and their, their <laughs> wills uh, strong. So, uh, but, but Idaho's a, a very highly skilled team and got, a, like I say, a, a, a really kind of all-conference type power forward that, that we've got to control. But uh, a, a team similar to us, you know, struggling for, for confidence and identity, uh, they play about half zone, half man, mm -hmm. which tells me they'll come in here and play about 90% zone against us. Uh, but, uh, you know, since we've been struggling to score. But uh, offensively, they run some really nice uh, sets and, and do a good job. But, uh, you know, it'll be a competitive game, as will Seattle. Now, the, the WAC opener obviously is a big deal, just like the, the first game of the season is a big deal, the home opener is a big deal. So now it's the WAC home opener. So are there any additional butterflies or it's just like I'm just ready for this no you know the big deal is for you guys and the fans <laughs> and the people and the administration you know the game it doesn't matter if it's 
UT San Antonio or Sam Houston or whatever. It's, a, it's another game to play your best, play each possession as well as you can and do your job. Uh, the excitement is more for the university and everybody involved that, you know, hey, we're in a league now and, and this is our first home game and, and a chance to uh, get our first home win in the MAC or the WAC. <laughs> Back to Mac, Akron? MAC was a long time ago. <laughs> and then uh, on Saturday, uh, you get to play your second straight home game for the first time since November as uh, Seattle U comes to town for another 7 o'clock start. Well, what are they like? Well, uh, uh, one of the best three-point shooting teams in the league, uh, very athletic. They have a, uh, a another power forward kid, uh, Trent, that he was recruited by us at Arkansas back when I was at Arkansas. He was on a campus visit with us, you know, uh, heck, uh, five years ago. So he was just going to be a junior. He was a junior at that time, a highly touted kid. Uh, ended up signing at uh, Washington and then transferring to Seattle. But uh, really, really a good kid. And then they're, they're three-point shooting at the guard, so that's very strong too. So, again, uh, two formidable opponents to get open in here with. And, but it's time for, for us to play well. It's about right now I think it's more about what we're doing than what the other teams are doing. And, of course, it's also your last chance to play the so-called pro uh, schedule. School starts back up on Monday, so uh, getting in is uh, the 24-hour practices? Yeah, we're getting in. What we do is we shoot in the mornings, and then we come back with practice in the afternoon. So it gets us a lot of extra shots up. It's nice. Uh, Adam opened up the gym, so now we got six buckets to work with, and we can get a lot of shots up. And it, it, it's been good for us that way. Hasn't sh hasn't shown yet, but again, <laughs> repetitions can never hurt you. You know, it's, I can't pat you on the back and say, "Hey, Jonah, you're going to make them." You know, well, somewhere that's not going to happen. Get, yeah, I know that. that. That's what I'm trying to prove. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, I'd put you in. But uh, you know, it, it's good reps. Plus, it's it keeps their brains occupied. And I'm a big believer that the athletic part is is great, but it. It is a part of the, the, the academic deal, and, and the kids being in class is, is a better thing for them. You know, it, it puts them in a better rhythm. It, it puts them in a, you know, a more scheduled time frame, and uh, I, I think it's really good for them. All right. Well, the Bronx take on Idaho Thursday at 7 p.m. Seattle on Saturday at 7 p.m. To get some more information, visit utpabronx.com. If you're in the Valley, we expect to see you out here. Doors at 6. If you are watching us from anywhere else around the world, pregame coverage begins at 6.45 p.m. right here on 956sports.com. Well, that'll do it for us for this edition of the UTPA Men's Basketball Show. He's Dan Hipscher. He's the head coach of the UTPA Men's Basketball Team. My name's Jonah Goldberg. We'll see you back here next week on 956sports.com.